Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to welcome you here this morning to this service of worship, whether you're here with us in person in the sanctuary or watching by the live stream wherever you may be, or even our follow-up on television. We are glad that you are part of the worshiping family of First Methodist Houston. Let us pray. God, we are grateful to be here in whatever way we are here. We ask that you would strengthen the connection between each and every one of us to allow us to come to worship together as a family, as friends, and as those who want to discern and follow your will. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing this morning for our hymn of welcome, which is Lord God, your love has called us here.
may be seated. I want to remind you this morning that here on this campus, next Sunday is our Agape Market. And so we will have that going on before and after service. And I hope that you will take advantage of that opportunity to look for that perfect Christmas gift or whatever you may need. There will be crafts and sewing projects from our Sewing Connection. Uh, tamale orders can be placed from Neighbors in Action. You can purchase items from the refugee women from our International Friends Ministry and sponsor items for our Lifeline and our food pantry. So we hope that you will join us. And if you can't make next week here on this campus, then it will be on the 24th the following week at our West Campus. Yeah, and it's going to be a busy Sunday next Sunday because there's also a blood drive downtown as well. So I wanted you all to be able to plan for that amidst all the other exciting activities that are going on. I promised an update today for our Abundantly More 2025 annual campaign and wanted to, to just let you know of our progress. Though Commitment Sunday was a couple of weeks ago, it is still stewardship season. And so we are, we are overjoyed to continue to receive pledges. Uh, we do so every day and will in the weeks ahead. Many uh, need to wait till the end of the year to figure out kind of how income's gonna work in the next year. So we know uh, we're really just getting started and building toward our goal. So as of this morning, we have received 102 pledges toward our Abundantly More campaign, totaling $985,348. Now, I like to benchmark just to give you a sense of our progress. And so if you compare that to this year's 2024 Multiply campaign, which received a total of 200 pledges, totaling just over $2 million, you get a sense of where we are and what ground we need to cover to get to our goal. Now, I'm, I'm really pleased with the progress thus far. This is where I would expect to be at this time in the season, uh, at this point in the year. I know that additional pledges will continue to come in. I want to say thank you to all who have prayerfully considered a financial commitment to support our mission and our ministries next year. Just as you budget in your household based on income that you would anticipate, we do the same for God's house. When you're able to commit, and, and it's just that, it's a, it, it's a commitment, but it can be changed as your situation changes. But it does help us to be great stewards of uh, the resources entrusted for God's work to the church. And, and so really, just from the bottom of my heart, wanna say thank you uh, for turning in your, your pledge commitment. It's not too late, uh, never really is until the end of next year, in fact, uh, to turn in your commitment card. And there are multiple ways to do that. Uh, first, we have some available on the usher stand and the welcome desk. You can pick up a card to take home, to pray over, and bring back and drop in the plate, or you could mail it to the church anytime you're ready. You can also give anytime online at fmhouston.com slash abundantly hyphen more. And there's an online commitment card there, and you can commit from home or from wherever you are. I wanna thank you so much for your generosity and support. Thank you for being the church. And as our ushers prepare to lead us in the ministry of generosity and giving, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and loving God, you are the giver of every perfect gift. You are the creator of all things. You have entrusted to us a portion of your abundance, and you call us as your people to share from the abundance that you have shared with us. And so, God, as we open up our hearts to give in this moment, we pray that you would use these gifts, receive them as our offering to you, so that we can bless one another and be a blessing to our community. Lord, help us to understand and to see our giving as bright, shining light that helps us to take your ministry to the very ends of the earth. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
As we remain standing as we are able this morning, I want to invite us to join together in a congregational prayer. This morning, that prayer being the prayer of St. Francis. Let us pray together. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. You may be seated, and I would like to invite any children who are present to come forward and spend some time with Ms. Courtney. All right, good morning, guys. How are y'all today? Good. I'm so glad to see you all today. Okay. So I want you to tell me, what do you think of when you see a heart? What do you think of? Love. love. God's love. Kindness. Blood. Okay. Does anybody think about Valentine's Day too? That's, what I, that's the first thing. I got this from our Valentine's Day bucket of things. So probably when you see a heart, probably the very first thing that comes to your mind is to think about love. Who are some people that you love? My grandma and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa. Grandparents. Mom and dad. Mom and dad. Grandparents. Okay. Mom and dad. Oh, everyone in your family. Family. Okay, I was waiting. Nobody specifically said their brothers or sisters, but I have a good feeling that you do love your brothers and sisters. Um, what about your best friend? Do you love your best friend or your teacher? Um, it's easy to love these people because they love us too, right? It's easy to love your family because you're like the most important thing to them. Um, have you ever had a kid that was mean to you at the playground or at lunchtime or just in school? Has anyone ever said something about you that wasn't true? Maybe they told another person something about you that wasn't true. Or have you ever been around someone that was just so different that it was really hard for you to like them or to be their friend? Okay. Do you love those people? Should we really be expected to love people that are either unkind to us or tell it lies about us or just completely and totally different than us? Well, let's see what Jesus said about it. So one day, Jesus, he was teaching up on a hillside, and we called this lesson that day the Sermon on the Mount. Now, in his sermon, Jesus said some things that really surprised the people that were there to listen to him. 
Jesus said, you have heard that you should love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies. And if someone does mean and hateful things to you, pray for them. So why should we love our enemies? Jesus said that when we love our enemies, we are acting like children of God because we are loving the children of God. If we only love those who love us, is God going to be pleased with us? If we're only kind to friends or other people who are like us or who like us, what's so great about that? Everybody can be nice to people that are nice to them, right? But when we have the words of Jesus in our heart, we're different, and the way that we treat people is differently. Even people that we might consider our enemies, the way we treat them is differently than the way the rest of the world might treat them. It's not easy to love your enemies all the time, but there's some good reasons for doing it. So I wrote down a couple reasons that came to my mind, and I want help reading them. It sets a good example for others to follow. It shows the love of God to others. It can turn enemies into friends. Wow, the love of God is so big that it could take an enemy in your life and turn it into a friend. Isn't that really good and amazing news? Let's pray this morning. So I'm going to pray first, and y'all can repeat after me. Dear God, it's easy to love those who love us. Help us to love our enemies, so that they might know we are all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, now you can all join us for Kids Church if you'd like. which comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. As I read, listen for a word from the Lord. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. 
Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers or sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Throughout the month of November, we are studying what it means to be a people of the and. The world forms us to be an either-or people, a people who get into camps, choose sides, alienate ourselves from one another. But Jesus calls us to live according to the power of and, holding intention, ideas, concepts, groups, even people that the world would whisper in our ear to be driven and kept apart. Last week, we studied the great commandment where Jesus said that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. We learned that in Jesus' day, there were those who would seek to make that an either or, or at least to be selective about who the neighbor was that they were to love. In Luke's gospel, the parable of the great Samaritan is given as an illustration of the great commandment, where a scribe seeking to justify himself asked, and just who is my neighbor? And it turns out to be the dastardly, dirty old Samaritan that he tried to keep himself so far from. Jesus asked, who is the one who was a neighbor to the man beaten and left for dead? The scribe said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, then go and do likewise. Turns out the love of God and the love of neighbor are inseparably linked. One is the fruit of the other. And you can start on either side and look across the divide and know that that is really true. The degree to which you're able to love your neighbor demonstrates the fruit of the love that you have for God. The degree to which you are able to love God with everything you've got really grounds the degree to which you're able to demonstrate love toward your neighbor. So we need to be a, a people of the and. Today, we encounter Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us another and statement. He says, the world says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy and hate, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So it's not a love friend or foe, it's both. It's a both and. I want to share a story with you to frame this a little bit. We begin with the end in mind. So Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Once uh, a young father was going on a business trip for a few days, and he had a couple of small children at home and was worried about the extra burden that he was going to be placing upon his wife and his departure. And so he went to his son, who was about nine or ten at the time, and, and he asked hey, while I'm gone, I need you to do the things that I would normally do. I need you to help your mom be the man of the house, step up, so that things are a little easier without me here. Can you do that, buddy? Yeah, Dad, I can do it. And so the father went back, checked in every day, of course, and then came home and said, well, how did, how did the week go? Uh, did our son step up? Was he helpful? And his wife said, you know, the funniest thing happened. Uh, he decided that he liked coffee for some reason. He had cup after cup, after cup. And he would leave the cup on the counter. Strange. And he would turn up loud music and go and sit in the the living room for hours on end, reading the news off of the iPad. 
I don't understand what came over him. Well, the father had a different idea than the son. When the father said, follow my example, do what I do, the son took that very literally. (laughs) What the father meant was help clean up after dinner. Put the dishes in the dishwasher. Pick up your clothes off the floor and put them in the basket. Lighten your mother's load. And instead, he saw the other more surface level things. Jesus says here, I have come into this world to show you the heart of my Father, to make visible and practical the the laws and the will and the commandments of my Father, so that what you see me put into practice, you will also do. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew's gospel, the audience is Jewish. Jesus is preaching, and Matthew is writing to a particular group of people who had been called for a particular purpose. They had been chosen by God. And what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon on the Mount is that, yes, you were chosen, but I don't play favorites. God doesn't play favorites. He didn't choose you to leave the rest of the world in darkness. He chose you to shine a light into the darkness so that the world that does not yet know me could be drawn into a relationship with me and my Father through the Spirit. And so when Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, he holds before us what seems to be an impossible standard. For we all have read Romans, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have. I do every single day. And yet, Jesus tells us to strive after perfection in love. You know, that's why I'm a Methodist, a Christian in the Wesleyan tradition. Because one of our distinctives is that we seek to be made perfect in love. You've heard me say before that one of the ordination questions pastors are asked when we stand before the bishop after eight years or so of of study and of residency and all the things we have to do, we are asked, do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? And we have to say, yes, by the grace of God. We don't believe that we are perfect. However, we believe that if we don't strive to love like Jesus on this side of eternity, we will never hope to attain the standard. And here's the headline. Once we are in heaven in the presence of God and we see God fully and we ourselves are fully known, we will love perfectly as God loves us. I quote almost every week John 3.16. If you want to know the heart of the Father, read John 3.16 and 17. For God so loved who? The world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be what? Saved through him. The father gave everything, gave his son for the world. Not just those who already loved and believed in return, but for those who were yet to love in return and to believe. And in that life-giving, sacrificial presence and love, the heart of the Father is demonstrated for the sake of the world as light shone brightly into the darkness, drawing people toward the warmth and the presence and the love and the mercy of God. What I love about Jesus and His teaching is that He gets really practical. He doesn't keep things at a high level to where we can't understand, he, he gets down into the nitty-gritty. And so to frame this love of neighbor and love of enemy, he gives three examples in the, the verses preceding. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is a Jewish audience. This is an Old Testament teaching. The idea was, look, instead of letting things escalate to a point of major conflict, if somebody wounds you and you have to lose your eye, then the person who wounded you should have to lose his or her eye also. If someone has knocked out a tooth, well, the retribution is that you also should lose a tooth. 
even Stephen, no need to fight beyond that. That was the standard to which the people believed they were being held when Jesus preached. But he turns these ethics upside down and he says, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. When I was a child, I remember studying, hearing this passage, and I thought, oh, that just means to turn and walk away, right? If I get my, my cheek slapped, I just ought to walk away from the person. I knew it, it meant that I don't get even, but oh, as I've dug into this passage, how I wish it meant that, it means something even more difficult. It means that if somebody slaps you on your left cheek, you are to turn and let them slap you on your right as well with no retribution. You stand and you receive it, looking them in the eye, letting them deal with what it is that they are doing, demonstrating mercy and grace, but not reacting in the way that the person deserves in that moment. That reminds me of Isaiah's prophecy that's often used to frame Jesus' own crucifixion, where it says, as a sheep in the presence of his shearers was silent, and in the face of evil did not open his mouth. I'm reminded of that in this teaching here. Jesus says, don't get even. Show a more excellent way. He goes on. He says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. What's the difference between coat and cloak? One is an outer garment. One is an under garment. In that day and age, somebody that was owed money could take the one who owed the debt to court, and if the person could not pay, could extract payment by taking the very shirt off someone's back. Jesus was saying, if that were to happen, give them your underwear as well and shame them by your nakedness so that what they are doing will be fully revealed to all who are there to witness it. That's the weight of Jesus' teaching. We prayed earlier the prayer of St. Francis, and I love the story about St. Francis. His father was very shrewd. He was a hard man. He was a, a purveyor of cloth and a clothing maker. He had a, a factory where clothes were made. And Francis grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, so to speak. He had no expense spared, had everything he ever wanted. I mean, he was like the younger brother in the parable of the prodigal. Whenever he wanted to celebrate with his friends, his father would fund it from his fortune. Well, as Francis grew up, he began to feel God's call in his life, and one day he was praying in a broken down, dilapidated church, and he heard God calling him to fix the church. And so he went to his father's factory and found that his dad was out of town, and so he went and got two bolts of expensive fabric and sold it and took the money to the priest and said, here, here is the money to fix the church. The priest refused to receive it because he knew the kind of man that Francis' father was. And so Francis left everything. He went and he begged in the streets for money to repair the church. His father came back into town. He was infuriated by what Francis had done. And he goes to the bishop and says, you have got to do something to knock some sense into my son. And so the bishop calls Francis in in front of a whole assembly, his father being present, and says, you need to strengthen your resolve. You need to do the right thing. You need to make good for your father. You need to return the money that you had taken. You need to leave this frivolity behind, this, this folly rather, and be reunited with your family. Francis thought for just a moment, and he stripped his outer and inner garments, handed them to the priest, and stood naked before the assembly. And he said, everything I have and everything I own, I renounce and give myself fully to God. And from that day, he never turned back, and his father left, humiliated by what his son had done. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, you give your cloak as well. Finally, Jesus says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. There was a statute during Jesus' time where if a Roman soldier compelled you to carry his helmet or his armor or his weapons or his bags, that you were to do that, but no further than one mile. 
And Jesus is saying, if that happens, go the extra mile. In fact, go all the way to the destination. If you've watched The Chosen in the last season, there's this scene, and it's, it's a really powerful scene because, you know, the, the soldiers come very prideful at first and, you know, look at the power we have over these, these Jews, right? We can ask them to do this, and they have to do it, so they reluctantly do. And Jesus tells them to press on and press on. And the further they go, the soldiers begin to feel humiliated. No, 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 stop. No, no, one mile was enough. Please, anything. No, no, we're going to do this. They get to the end and say, why would you go the extra mile when all you had to do was one? And the headline was, because we follow him and nothing less is expected of us. Wow. Wow. By doing the right thing, by having the inner strength of spirit, you show a more excellent way. Jesus teaches, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In fact, what Jesus really is saying here is that blur the lines and erase the lines between those whom you would label friend and those you would label foe. These are categories that we ourselves construct. We put ourselves into boxes and we separate ourselves one from another. I have been shocked at the way Christians have talked to and about one another after this presidential election. No matter how you voted, none of us as Christians should have the right to judge and demoralize and denigrate somebody who voted the other way just because they voted differently than we did. We do not have that right. Jesus says, you renounce all claims to your side. Sure, vote. It's your right and privilege. We, today, we're going to celebrate veterans in just a moment. We live in a country where this right is given to all of us, and we must do everything we can to protect it. And yet, Christians are called to a more excellent way. We're not called to other one another we're not called to create enemies or to put ourselves in a box that separates us from our brothers and sisters. We're called to be one in Christ Jesus. Christ died so that we could be set free from the law that divides us, the law of sin and death. And the world, oh, the world beyond is looking to us to see how we get along, how we are one across all of the divides that exist in our culture. And here's the reality. We're about half and half here at First Methodist, believe it or not. But about half of us voted Republican and half voted Democrat. Some might have voted Green Party or Libertarian. I don't know. But we have to realize that, that, that seated in the pew next to you may be somebody whose vote might surprise you. And you know what? That's okay. That makes us stronger as a church. We need to seek to understand before we are understood, to seek to know before we ourselves are made known, as St. Francis prays. To bring all of this home, Jesus says, God makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? The Father seeks good for all that God made. And if the Father and the Son can, so should we, is the word that Jesus gave. Friends, Jesus shows us the very heart and will of his Father, not only in what he says, but in what he does. And we as followers of Jesus, as his disciples, are to show the very heart of the Father and the Son in the ways in which we love one another. So let us strive with everything we've got to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, to be merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful, to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, today, uh, before we go on this eve of Veterans Day, we want to honor those who have put their lives in harm's way, who have served bravely and valiantly in our armed forces. And 
So I want to do something today that's, that's quite special. I want us as a call to prayer to remain seated, uh, and I want to sing a couple of verses of the Navy hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. And I want us to remain seated in a posture of prayer because I want you to focus on, on what the words say and how they speak to us uh, on this Veterans Day in particular. So I'm going to ask the choir to lead us in our call to prayer. Let us pray. God, we are grateful. We are grateful for all that you have done for us. We are grateful for your presence in our lives. We are grateful that you bind us together as your children. And we are grateful for the sacrifice that you made to show your love for us. As we continue together in worship this morning, we ask that you would help us always to live for your will and not for our own. To look at those who walk beside us and know that there's truly no need to love friend and foe, for all should be friend. and even when others mistreat us, to think how Christ was mistreated and the love he continued to show. We ask that you would give us the strength always to go that extra mile, to show your love, to show your grace, to show all that surround us that they are your children, and that makes them our brothers and sisters, and therefore we will love. As we have this holiday weekend here in our country, God, we thank you for those who have taken the time, who have given so much out of their willingness to give of themselves for us, even though they may not know us at all. So we thank you for all of those who have served for the purpose of defending the rights that we hold dear as rights of all people. We are grateful for those who came home to their families and for those who are in the room here with us today. We are also grateful for those who never made it home. 
and show that there is no greater love than to give of one's life for your friends. So God, as we think of those sacrifices that have been necessary throughout time, we ask that you would help us to build a world where we do seek to understand one another instead of seeking to fight one another to be understood. Help us to be a loving community, to be those who love each other regardless of how we are treated and who go forth in your love and in your name. We are grateful for those lessons that came to us from Jesus Christ. And we are eternally grateful for all the lessons that Christ taught us during his time here on earth, including when we asked him how to pray. And so this morning, as we remember the words he taught us, we say them aloud together, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we go, I want to invite you into a time of prayer and to praise. Our rail is open, as it is every week, for you to come and to pray. Uh, leave your burdens here. Let Jesus carry them for a mile or two uh, while you seek comfort and peace in Him. Our closing hymn is one of our beloved uh, Charles Wesley hymns. Uh, Charles Wesley was one of the founders of this movement that we're a part of as Christians in the Methodist tradition. Uh, whenever I sing a Charles Wesley hymn, I know why uh, I have chosen to follow God uh, in this movement of which we are a part. He tells us how to do from Scripture what we've talked about today. So I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, Jesus, Lord, we look to Thee. Let us stand.
As we prepare to move forward this morning, we want to remind you of some opportunities to show your faith in the world. And the first I'd like to do today is the Thanksgiving in a bag. I've seen the bags lining the hallway out there, and we are grateful for that. I remind you that today is the last day for donations to that as we take care of families related to our church, including Neighbors in Action, and you can drop them off out in the lobby. You can also donate funds to help create meals for this family. Uh, and to do so, you can go to our website, fmhouston.com slash Thanksgiving in a bag and click on make a donation. Speaking of Thanksgiving, next Sunday is the NIA Thanksgiving Feast at Port Houston Elementary School. Uh, we need volunteers from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. to set up, decorate, serve, and clean up. I believe you can uh, pick a job that fits the amount of time you have to give. You can stay for some or all of that. You can register to volunteer by visiting fmhmissions.com slash serve, and you'll find Thanksgiving, in a or Thanksgiving feast. You can click on that to register to help next week. And our ministry at West Campus, the Quillian Center, has their Quillian Golf Tournament coming up on December 10th. And so I want to remind you uh, that that is available. You can still sign up teams. A team uh, is 350 and single players are 85. This is a great opportunity to support the youth that we serve through that ministry. It's also a great opportunity to promote your business while supporting them. If you want to bring clients or um, co-workers with you or you just want to do a single um, registration and play together, you can also sponsor holes if that's something you'd like to do. And we appreciate anything you can do to help support those ministries to the children of our community. Or you can come and laugh at me because the, the only golf I play is mini. <laughs> but I'll be there in spirit to support those who are true golfers. Well, we have something special after the benediction today. Uh, I'm going to stay in place because uh, Paul has prepared a special postlude to honor our veterans, uh, the, the Armed Forces Medley, and, and I'm going to stay for that. I invite those of you who are able to stick around for five minutes or so to do that. But we understand if you need to go uh, and continue on with your day as well. I want to send us forth with these words of blessing. Friends, Jesus calls us to show a more excellent way. Paul tells us how we do that, through love, reminding us that love is patient and kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking or easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, always protecting, trusting, hoping, and persevering. Friends, love never fails. Go forth today to love as Jesus loved us, and go forth today and every day and be the church. Amen.